I'm interested in your earliest memories of fashion because you've talked before about how you you weren't interested particularly when you were growing up. But I'm no, interested. I mean I can't remember. I think I was born at eleven uh, because I can't remember anything before eleven. Nothing. And then uh, then I got my racing bike and. And then I became int- involved in the world of cycling. And it, so I think I was probably around 16 before I uh, actually can remember anything about fashion. fashion yeah. I got a suit uh, from the place I was working. I was working as a gopher in a, in a warehouse, you know, going to the post office and unwrapping parcels and stuff like that. But, and they sold clothes, but they just sold clothes. They weren't fashionable clothes, just clothes. And, um, and then one day, this funny green four button suit came and it was called a San Remo <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that's all right I like that so I, that was my first little touch of fashion I felt very posh in it so it was more about the feeling that you get from a particular item it wasn't about well I think it was because I'd never really thought about fashion at all in any way I just wanted to be a professional racing cyclist and then suddenly this suit arrived and uh, I've always been quite slim and tall, so it was a skinny cut suit, you know, San Remo was based on all those La Dolce Vita and all those movies, so it was little skinny, skinny legs and little skinny jacket. You wanted to be a professional cyclist, as you said, what was the point where that changed and you started to think, you know, fashion and retail, that's your... Well, I mean, it, was a, it wasn't my choice, I mean, yeah. I just, uh, I was out one day, age 17, training, um, very st- bright sunny day, a bit like today actually, and uh, just hit a car, broke my leg, femur, knee, fingers, ribs, nose, hospital for three months. I got up and my bone came through my thigh. Oh, it was horrible. Oh, God. And um, those days, you know, you took a lot longer than it does now because you have to have your leg in traction and uh, it just take the weight for it to mend and it's all very very slow process when i came out of hospital i arranged to meet a few guys that i'd, be, I'd met in hospital other other patients um, motorbike accident car accident we all got to become friends one said oh why don't we meet up have a drink i'd never been to an english pub because when you're a cyclist you don't drink you don't smoke it's very <laughs> Very uh, about keeping fit, glucose drinks and early to bed. Probably boring in hindsight, come to think of it. But um, the, the, by chance, the pub one of them chose was the pub where where all the art school people went, and it was brilliant. I mean, after a, two, a few visits, started to talk to a few other people, and suddenly, um, oh, what do you do? I'm a young architecture student. Oh, I'm a graphic design student. And I didn't even know what graphic design was. No idea. And then suddenly this whole world opened up. People were saying things like, oh, well, the Bauhaus. And I didn't know what the Bauhaus was. I thought it was a house down the road. <laughs> and then Kandinsky and Pop Art and Andy Warhol and Cabusier. And, and then eventually I met somebody who was opening a little clothes shop. Uh, Dad was setting her up in a little clothes shop. Uh, she was going to make the clothes. And she said, I have no idea how to make uh, how to open a shop or to what to do and I said I do even though I had no idea either <laughs> I was 18 and so I found the shop helped her out um, got did the lease you know met something somebody called a solicitor <laughs> you know just stuff I'd never done before so it was brilliant and then I helped her open the shop ran the shop for her started doing the window dressing and slowly slowly it progressed from there I'm glad you mentioned that shop because your background it is commerce rather than sort of fashion design. How th- how has that affected how you've operated from then? Well, right I mean, I now? think one of the reasons why uh, why I've managed to survive, uh, you know, in quite a nice way for a long time is because I've got this sort of balance between okay at design and okay at, okay at business. Because you know, I, work, I ran a shop, and when you run a shop, open the door ten o'clock close the door at six o'clock, have to pay the rent, understand about customers coming in the door. And in a provincial town, which it was in my hometown of Nottingham, you get the same customer coming over and over again. So it's always your job to move the shop around, keep it looking fresh, change the windows. So it's it's been really a a fantastic ingredient uh, in addition to my ability to be able to design mm. although I'm not a sort of edgy designer like a lot of the amazing people you've had in this studio but uh, 
I'm very capable of coming up with ideas and uh, I suppose I'm more of a stylist really. Hmm. You said that you're more of a stylist which I find really interesting because there's an element of what you do which I think straddles fashion and clothes and I'm, I'm, inter I'm very interested in the difference something what's high fashion and what's commerce and what's clothes. Yeah. What do you think you create? Well, I mean, I think, I think at the beginning, well, first of all, just to put it in perspective without boring all your audience, but I mean, um, you know, my, my teacher was Pauline, my girlfriend then and my wife now. So after working for three years in the shop, uh, I met Pauline. She was teaching at the art school in Nottingham. She had trained as a fashion designer at the Royal College of Art in London and um, at a very high level because then they used to teach couture fashion. So they actually taught you how to make clothes and the importance of proportion, the importance of stitching, uh, how to put a sleeve in. She taught me all that just at home because I left school at 15. And uh, she, she taught me all that at home. And so my actual background was understanding about the importance of good quality, proportion, scale, ha uh, stitches, beautiful buttons. So right from the beginning, it was always quite simple but actually really lovely quality. And at the time when I started out, there was loads of young designers that were far more talented in terms of creativity. But sadly, a lot of the clothes they made weren't that good of quality and, and they fell by the wayside because they'd deliver things to a department store in America or something and get all the clothes back and it sadly didn't work for them. And with mine, it was just sort of okay. It was just nice, good fashion, but in good quality. And that's how the whole Paul Smith thing came about, which was, you know, classic with the unexpected. You know, it was just the fact that there was always this little secret, you know, hiding in your pocket or, or like the shirt you can't see, but it's got embroidery on it. But it looks like a regular shirt, but it's got some embroidery on it. So it was, it was always these little, little, it wasn't ever high fashion. I think that's also helped with the continuity of Paul Smith because it's always been very wearable. It's... Um, uh, I suppose the, the flip side is where it's never been taken as seriously maybe as I would have hoped by you know some of the 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 fashion gurus who are more impressed with you know design which is more complicated or more uh, you know more worked on. Mm. I'm glad you mentioned that because I wanted to ask you about your relationship with fashion journalists and fashion critics because I think from my perspective there's an idea that the more commercial the commercially successful you've become, it's even it's taken even less seriously in a sense because people do fetishise the new and the young. Yeah, I mean, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, I think you know the odd thing is that you assume that when you're a young uh, student studying photography or film or design or being a uh, presenter or an interviewer, you, you presume that you want to earn a living from it and you want it to be successful. Mm. But <laughs> the odd thing, especially in this country, in Britain, is that when you're commercially successful it's like oh well you're not uh, necessarily as uh, as creative as or, or as cool as somebody who's doing things which are a bit more attention seeking so it's a bit of an odd odd thing but uh, luckily I'm very at ease with life so it doesn't worry me you know but I want to talk about your retail experience that you've created today because that's obviously something that's very dear to the brand and dear to you is creating this very exciting retail experience do you think that retail elsewhere has become a bit sanitized why is that so well, I think, I think what's, what's happened with a lot of the big brands around the world is that they, they followed the idea of a business plan. I think, unfortunately, so many people in the world, including lots of human beings and young human beings, are, are, their life is like a business plan. It's like what you should do, how you should do it. And, and the thing is, with um, a lot of the big brands, they, they were under the pressure to open 20 shops a year or whatever and uh, it's, it's a formula which is akin to the coffee shops around the world or anything. It's just a formula, um, building it up with lots of marketing, opening lots of shops, but unfortunately a lot of the shops are like a rubber stamp, you know, they're all very similar. And um, my shops, are, are none of them are the same because I've always hated that idea. I've always liked the idea that you go into a porcelain shop and you're just a bit confused why you, one of them is full of vinyl or you know motorbikes or it could be anything or ceramics or old cameras and that's always because I've just wanted people to enjoy going into the shop and also because I'm not a very con I'm not a confrontational person I'm a person who likes people 
And my first little shop was uh, three meters square, about the size of where I'm sitting now. And so when a customer walked in, they were literally in front of you straight away. So, you know, that, that was very confrontational. So I needed some sort of aid to help me out, to make people more relaxed. So if I was on a little backpacking holiday with Pauline and her children to Greece, I'd buy some notebooks from an old stationer's and some pen knives from a fish, you know, ship's chandler's or something like that. And I'd bring those back to my shop and they were like a, an icebreaker. They were a little aid when people walked in and like, hello, how are you? Oh, do you see these? I just got these when I was in France or I just got these when I was on holiday. And it was just a way of making people feel more, feel more relaxed. And uh, so I've kept that up. And uh, as you know, that's been an enormous, um, uh, enormous influence on a lot of shops around the world. I'm really interested you say, you know, making people feel at ease, because this goes back to what we were talking about, about the difference kind of between high fashion and clothes, because I think there is definitely an openness and a vibrant sort of accessibility to what you do. And I mean that in a really positive way. But do you right. think that's also something that fashion critics are quite disparaging of. Oh, absolutely, yeah, you're, you're hitting the nail right on the head there. And, you know, when you're too normal and when you're too accessible and when you, your priorities are uh, the road sweeper in the street that you have a chat with or school children that write into you or, the, you know, a rock star or a famous actor. I mean, when you're so diverse, people, I think, find it hard to put you into a category and, and, and know how to deal with you. And so sometimes that is a is is a it's just sad for me that people um, just think you're not sort of there because you're too normal. But why is there this idea that high fashion has to be lofty or difficult? I don't know. You ask them, not me. I've no idea. I mean, I've always been confused by that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, we sell to shops in uh, seventy-two countries around the world. Our things sit next to all the famous designer labels. Um, and uh, our things do something called sell. Sorry, everybody, but they sell. A rainy Tuesday in Bologna or Sydney, Australia, you open the box and you put the shirts on the shelf and they sell. And we've, our sell-throughs around the world have always been fantastic. And I suppose that's a combination of all the hard work for over the years of doing interesting things, doing alternative things, knowledge of my my profession, uh, running shops, and so it's, it's sort of a good a good cocktail of stuff, I suppose. How involved are you in the day-to-day -day sort of design processes? What, what, what's your day like? How do you spend your time? Um, I'm, well, uh, as you probably know, I'm um, early bird, so swim every morning at five-ish, five-ish, five fifteen get to work at six, which I love, it's absolutely brilliant. I love London early in the morning, often take lots of photographs, I love the sun coming up in the summer, if we ever get any. And, um, and then get to work, it's really quiet for two hours, uh, and then the day starts, and then it's an eight o'clock appointment, a nine o'clock, a 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and that can be so varied, lots of hats, you know, so we do all our shop design in-house. We've got a big team of uh, shop designers, young architect, interior designers, uh, all our marketing's in-house, um, sales, everything. So my job can go from shop design for two hours to talking to the marketing team to then uh, a whole afternoon of working with my assistant designers. So I'm on this floor, I've got some designers here, and then all the next floor below me are all full of my designers. and. Um, we all work together and I've got a very eclectic office full of like books and objects and kitsch things and beautiful things and they come around the table, we talk about things. Um, obviously when the, the, the key thing is like we're just starting for winter 14 now, uh, yeah winter 14. So you're always working a long time ahead so I've got to make sure this, this little, this particular uh, collection is about that and this collection is about that and this collection is about that so they don't all cross over with each other so one might be the colours from Mark Rothko and the others might be a film from a film and others might just be your knowledge of the market <clears throat> and just clothes you know so um, it's my job to sort of start everybody off and then keep keep my eye on the collections daily so it's a constant thing. 
So I'm really, really hands-on, really involved, watches, spectacles, shoes, socks, everything we do. And we do, you know, we design upholstery fabric for a Maharam in America, a big company in America. So whatever we do, um, there's nothing that goes out that I haven't actually at some point been involved with, which is really lovely. Is that what you get the most satisfaction from working with this big team? The satisfaction that I get is that every day is a new beginning and every day is fantastic and every day is so positive and I'm absolutely blessed with being the owner of the company so I don't have to discuss anything with anybody about whether this fits in with the corporate identity of the country company and what the shareholders are wanting more profit, greedy buggers. So, you know, we, we're just free, we're just open to do what we want to do and the, the key thing about creativity is spontaneity. You've just got to go for it. And you can't, by the time you deliberate, somebody's in the fast lane and overtaking you. So just go with it. So it's very much about instinct and uh, being um, your ingenuity and your, your knowledge of what you do for a living, really. You say someone's in the fast lane overtaking you, but you also touched on this earlier that there are lots of incredibly talented designers who've fallen by the wayside. Why are you still here? Is it that balance and still here? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I'm, um, I think why I'm still there is that I love my job and so it's an absolutely honest thing. Um, we've, um, you know, originally the business was started by, with Pauline and myself, my wife, <clears throat> and it was very old fashioned the way we built the business. It was sort of the mentality. I mean, this is silly to say what I'm selling, saying, but you know, it's the mentality of the sort of fireplace with the jam jar and the money in and that the husband bought in. And uh, if there's money in the jam jar, you can spend it. And if you can't, you can't. So we've never borrowed any money as a company ever. Uh, we're very solid, but we built like this really, really slowly. And so many, unfortunately, uh, so many people want to grow so fast because uh, they um, are so full of information through the internet and through um, blogging and uh, tweet, twittering and the whole thing. So they're always making comparisons. Oh my God, he's earning that, she's doing that. They're opening that shops and everybody's panicking all the time that they need to keep up. And I'm not like that. I'm just very happy to have the freedom of my my own day and, and make my own decisions. and. Uh, and that's because I built it very gently and very slowly, never overstretched ourselves. And even during this more difficult time, because the world's in such a mess at the moment, um, is we're still seeing increases because we've never really pushed it. Whereas a lot of the big companies were pushing, pushing, pushing the last 15 years to expand more and more and more to keep up with their hedge fund investors and their, you know, their the people that have put money into them so they've had to run and I've just been having a gentle stroll. <laughs>